Well, everyone, welcome. I'm so glad you're with us today, and I'm happy to be back with you. Uh, I was gone the last four weeks, five Sundays, but I'm really glad to be with you and open the Word of God with you today. As we come into the home stretch on this summer teaching series called The Law on Our Hearts, the 10 words for today, the Decalogue, the 10 commandments for today, all the thou shalt nots of the Bible, which we instinctively say, yay, tell me all the things I can't do, right? But if that's our view, it's really a skewed perspective because we have to recognize and remember that these 10 words are words of grace for the people that God loves. In fact, the context of the giving of the Ten Commandments is highly instructive. The people are meeting with God on Mount Sinai, halfway between Egypt and the Promised Land. Egypt, the land of slavery, sin and death. God has just brought His people out of there. As the Bible says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, God came down and saved His people. And he's bringing them into the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And the people are destined to be like kings and priests in that land with God. But here on Mount Sinai, God is first basically marrying his people, expressing his covenant love to them and constituting them as a nation. And he's giving them his law saying, this is what is going to rule and bound and guide our life together. You know, just as surely as the promised land has physical boundaries, the Ten Commandments are the spiritual and moral boundaries of the people's life together with God. And so they might seem restrictive on the surface. They might look narrow, but you got to see the expansive life that they are empowering and leading us into. You know, I said it was kind of like in The Lion King when Mufasa and Simba are surveying the pride lands. Mufasa says to his son, now you see all this land, all this good fertile land teeming with life, all that your eye can see, this is ours to rule and enjoy. Simba says, what about that shadowy place over there? <laughs> nope, that's the land of death. That is not what we're about over there. Or, or think about the Chronicles of Narnia, right? Uh, there's this narrow, cramped wardrobe. And when you get three or four children in there, they're elbowing each other and frustrated with one another, and it seems narrow. But it's just a portal into Narnia, where Aslan lives, this wonderland that these children themselves are destined to rule in with him. That's what the Ten Commandments are all about. And so we're going to read them and we're going to camp out on the ninth commandment today. But I want to read the first nine that we've covered so far in slightly condensed version. This is Exodus 20, 1 through 16. Let's hear the word of the Lord. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we are entitling today's message, We Don't Lie, which might immediately elicit like a chuckle from us because, oh, really? We don't? We don't lie? Kind of have to put an asterisk on that because you know what? The fact of the matter is, we do lie. We lie all the time. Some years back, a book was published uh, that reported on surveys done of the American people. It was called The Day America Told the Truth. 
Now, the funny thing about this book is in subsequent years, some social scientists took issue with the methodology and the research and said, these are kind of dubious results. I'm not even sure we can trust the day America told the truth. Kind of ironic. But I'm going to quote it anyway, because one of the surveys was all about lying. Like, how much do we lie? And this is what the authors concluded. Americans lie. They lie more than we had ever thought possible before we asked. 91% of us lie regularly. The majority of us find it hard to get through a week without lying. And one in five can't make it through a single day. There are more serious liars now than at any time in our nation's past. Lying has become a cultural trait in America. Lying is embedded in our national character. Now, I think those last sentences are true, don't you? But here's the crazy thing. This book was published in 1991, a full generation ago, before the internet, social media, fake news, misinformation spreading everywhere. You know, as they say, you know, lies run halfway around the world before the truth puts its shoes on. If lying was a part of American culture and embedded in our character a generation ago, how much worse is it today? In fact, more recent studies of stronger, more sound methodology are just showing how much we lie and how comfortable we get with it. I mean, neurobiology, neuroscience has actually shown that the more we lie, the easier it is to lie. We build those pathways into our brain and we suppress our emotional conscience reaction against lying. The more we lie, the easier it is to lie. And we knew that already, but brain science is showing that the proof. There was a longitudinal study done of people like asking questions, for example, like, is it okay to manipulate a story to get more clicks online? 15 years ago, the vast majority of people were like, no way, you could never manipulate a story just to get more clicks. Today in 2024, eh, most people are like, that's kind of the way the game is played, I understand. God help us how easily we lie, how comfortable we get it. We get habituated to it. We build the habit and we just get used to it. God help us. Especially given the fact that, you know, the Bible makes clear that there's a direct link between our hearts and our mouths. Out of the overflow of our hearts, our mouth speaks. And we might be casual about truth, but God isn't. In fact, God is the God of truth. Jesus' son is the way, the truth, and the life. The Holy Spirit who has been given to us is the spirit of truth. The Bible is called the word of truth. The lies, they come from the other source. Satan in the Bible is called the father of lies. When he lies and when we lie, we're doing his bidding. We're speaking his native language. God save us from that. You know, in my heart this week, as I've been preparing this, I've had this prayer in my heart. I hope it's in your heart as well. The end of Psalm 139, which is a beautiful psalm about life with God and how intimately acquainted he is with all of our ways and how close and intimate he wants to be with us. So there's nowhere we can go from his spirit. But at the end of the psalm, you know, David petitions, and this is a good prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous, wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's have that in our hearts as we now bear down on this ninth commandment about not bearing false witness. Now, I've said a lot already, like broadly and generally about lying, but this commandment starts with something very particular and specific. We are not to bear false witness against our neighbors. And the insinuation there is, you know, in a courtroom setting, when legalities are at stake. And this is the first and primary meaning of the text. And it's really important, especially for life in the ancient world, because when it came to right and wrong 
crime and punishment, the witnesses mattered immensely. I mean, way more than they do today, right? Because we've got DNA evidence. We got this whole science called forensics. We got surveillance cameras everywhere. The ancients didn't have any of that. It just was one person's word against another. So how do you ensure that somebody doesn't like make up a lie, bring a false accusation, and you know, get somebody else punished wrongly? Well, God put two additional stipulations on this that were helpful and very instructive. And we find them both in Deuteronomy 19. Uh, the first matter is uh, in a courtroom setting, you needed more than one witness. You needed some corroborating testimony. Deuteronomy 19, 15, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any other wrong in connection with any offense that he's committed. Only on the evidence of two or three witnesses shall a charge be established. By the way, this doesn't mean that you have to have two or three witnesses initially. Like I got to find people who saw this and bring them. You might just come with your own charge, but then it's like, okay, we're going to have to investigate this. See if anybody else has anything legitimately to say about this case. That's just an important safeguard. Here's an even more sobering one. Next verses. If a malicious witness arises to accuse a person of wrongdoing, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priests and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall investigate diligently and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So if they're accusing you of a capital crime, the false witness sacrifices his life. If he's accusing you of some business practice that's going to cause you know, great financial restitution to be made, that guy's got to make the restitution. So it's a great deterrent to wrongdoing. But now we need to understand, this is maybe the first most specific and particular uh, matter that the ninth commandment deals with. But it's also a commandment that's really a category heading over a whole area of life. I mean, just like murder is not just about murder, but you know, Jesus taught it's about undue hatred in our hearts. It's about contempt and anger. You shall not commit adultery. Yes, we want to be faithful to our spouses, but you shall not commit adultery also covers the whole category of sexual sin, premarital, extramarital, pornography, lust. All of that is in that commandment. And here in the commandment not to bear false witness in a courtroom setting covers the entire realm of lying in any setting. And the possibilities for lying and the ways in which we do it are almost too many to count. You know, I came across uh, what the Westminster Catechism teaches on this. You know, this catechism was written hundreds of years ago. It's a series of questions and answers on all sorts of Bible topics for the instruction, first and foremost, of children, but for any Christian, any believer. And the Catechism addresses the Ten Commandments. One of the questions, what are the sins forbidden in the Ninth Commandment? Okay, get ready. Here it comes. Answer, the sins forbidden in the Ninth Commandment are all prejudicing of the truth and the good name of our neighbors, especially in public courts, giving false evidence, bribing false witnesses, pleading for an evil cause, distorting or concealing the truth, undue silence in a just cause, and holding our peace when iniquity requires or calls for reproof, speaking the truth maliciously to a wrong end, or perverting it to a wrong meaning, lying, forgery, slander, backbiting, detracting, gossiping, flattering, boasting, scoffing, reviling, raising false rumors, receiving evil reports, or stopping our ears to those bringing a defense, hiding, excusing, or diminishing our own sins when we're called to confess. All of this is bound up in the ninth commandment. And I just want to cover some of these things just a, a little bit more so that we can appreciate the depth and breadth of this commandment. 
And notice how the good name of our neighbor is a chief concern. We all know the value of good reputation. The Bible makes it clear. A good name is more desirable than great riches. Money can come and go, but if you lose your reputation, you may never get it back. God save us from ever being party to the ruin of someone else's reputation. Uh, Notice there's a concern here, not only with all the many ways we can lie, but also the ways in which we can withhold the truth, undo silence in a just cause, holding our peace when a sin requires reproof. Just not speaking up can be a form of lying or speaking the truth in a way that actually creates a meaning that's a lie. Speaking the truth to a wrong end or perverting it to a wrong meaning. I, I came across like, this one of these like old preacher stories, but of uh, life on a sailing vessel hundreds of years ago, probably. And uh, one time the first mate on the boat uh, was engaged in some kind of misconduct. And the captain wrote him up in the ship's log. That didn't make the first mate very happy. So down the line, when the captain fell ill, and couldn't lead his crew for a number of days and the first mate was in charge, he not only led the men, but he made entries in the log. And the first day he said, Captain sober today. (laughs) True statement, right? But what does it imply? That he's drunk most of the other days. Like, boy, here's a notable thing. Captain's actually sober today. We can't be a part of any of that sort of thing. And then of course, all the things having to do with gossip and slander, you know, and just spreading bad news and repeating stories about one another. All this stuff is horrible. It's a lack of integrity. We either say behind someone's back what we wouldn't say to their face, or in the case of flattery, we say to their face what we would never say behind their back because we don't even believe it. We're just buttering them up. All of these things are under the ninth commandment. Receiving evil reports is a concern as well. You might not be the one spreading the gossip, but to you receive it, you know, the Bible talks about how the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. Mm -mm -mm, They taste so good. Uh, The ninth commandment, at least according to the Westminster Catechism, concerns not even receiving that. So, hey, I would say to kids going back to school, you know, uh, in in the next week or two, oh my goodness, you're going to hear so much gossip and slander. Not only should you not be speaking that, but God's people, God's kids are called to be the kind of people who don't even receive it. You might be, want to be the bold kid who speaks up when, when the conversation's going that way and just say, hey guys, we're killing this person. They've got their good sides too. Maybe we should just kind of let that go. Besides, I kind of believe what goes around comes around. You know, karma, um, however you want to cast it, you know, to, to get the message across to non-Christian friends. Um, Let's not receive these bad reports. And oh, one other thing. Let's not bear false witness against ourselves. If we're confronted with something and we either hide, excuse, or diminish our sin when we're called to confess, that's a kind of bearing a false witness too. So we don't want to be about this. And let's again, let's remember why. Why is God giving this commandment? Because he's leading us into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey, a rich, expansive, flourishing life together. Besides the fact that God himself is pro-truth, when he and his people are pro-truth, they're also pro-trust and love in relationships. When we're pro-truth, we're pro-justice in society. When we're pro-truth, We're pro-flourishing and abundance in the economy. When we're pro-truth, we're pro-mental and emotional health. All of these things rely on truthfulness and are undermined by lying. That's not God's design for us, the lying. But oh, the truth is, it is a key critical component of it. I love what Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in love. We will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. And maybe you know that speaking the truth in love 
is a rather free translation of that verse because it actually just says, true thing in love. Speaking is one big thing, you know, but true thing in love. You speak it, you, you love it, you do it, you seek it. We're, we're just all about truth and truth in it in love. And that's how we grow in all things into flourishing human beings who look a whole lot like Jesus Christ himself. So we don't bear false witness, but on the flip side, we bear true witness. That's what we're called to do. Speak the truth always at all times for the building up of one another. Ephesians 4, 29, a few verses later says, let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may give grace to those who hear. Hey, when we speak the truth to one another, we're just, we're just encouraging their flourishing. And we're flourishing ourselves as well. And oh, how we need to speak the truth to each other. Not just the hard truths, you know, sometimes you got to bring some tough love. Yeah, we got to do that. But just the encouraging words that remind people of who they are in Christ the hope and the future that they have in Him. You know, words that nourish and affirm because we believe the best about each other. Our sins are not the deepest things about us, not if we're in Christ. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Fundamentally, we are renewed, good people in Jesus. We need to see that in each other. Affirm it, call it out, build people up. You know, draw more of that goodness out of people. And we do that so often with our words. And that's why the Westminster Catechism not only delineates the things that the ninth commandment prohibits, but there's another question that goes like this. What are the duties required in the ninth commandment? Here comes the answer. The duties required in the ninth commandment are the preserving and promoting of truth between people and the good name of our neighbor, standing for the truth, sincerely, freely, and clearly speaking the truth in matters of judgment and justice and all other things whatsoever, a charitable esteem of our neighbors, loving, desiring, and rejoicing in their good name, freely acknowledging their gifts and graces, discouraging gossips, flatterers, and slanderers, keeping lawful promises, and studying and practicing whatsoever things are true, honest, lovely, and of good report. That's what we do proactively because we're pro-truth, pro-trust, pro-justice, pro-shalom and human flourishing. We want to be people who bring the truth in upbuilding ways. Hey, can I give you a really discouraged example of, uh, of the other these days? I'll bet you all know this person. I'll show you a picture here. Rachel Gunn, bless her heart, went to the Paris Olympics as a breaker, break dancer. And, you know, as they say, she, you know, she went into breaking, but what she really broke was the internet because everybody has just crushed this woman because she danced in ways they considered weird and unbecoming and weren't nearly as awesome or athletic as these breaking geniuses are. Uh, who are death-defying and gravity-defying in so many other moves. This woman wasn't so much. Didn't score a single point. Lost all three of her matches, 18 to nothing. And people are just crushing this woman. Like, this is who you are, and this is what's going to define you from here on out. And we want inquiries and everything else uh, into you, into how you ever got in this position. And oh my goodness, I've had a little bit of fun at her expense, honestly. Not, not online, but in interpersonal conversation. You know, I've, I've looked at some of the memes. The memes, they're mean. They're, they're, they're funny. Um, but, oh, that's not what we're called to be about. None of us wants to be defined by our worst character trait or our most foolish action in the world. And so we want to be the kind of people who know how to bear a, a true witness and when something goes sideways, especially of this sort, that's really not particularly consequential, we can let it go. Bearing true witness does not mean that we always have to speak the truth. 
Sometimes we're just going to hold back on our opinions. You know, by the way, this has led to lots of debate in the realm of philosophy and ethics, like how and when are you required to tell the truth and what actually constitutes a lie? And there are really two schools of thought on just how to even think about truth and lies. Uh, one school of thought says that a lie is saying anything that is contrary to love. The concern here in this school of thought is, yes, you want to make factual statements, but before you're speaking truth on particular facts, you want to be a true blue kind of person. You want to be truthful, faithful. You want to have fidelity to human relationships. So, you know, if somebody says, uh, do you like my haircut? Or does this swimsuit make me look fat? You might not entirely tell the truth. In a more significant situation, let's say you're living in Holland in the 1940s and you are graciously hiding some Jewish people in your house. If the Nazis come knocking on your door, you should be true blue to those people and lie through your teeth to the Gestapo. And who of us wouldn't do that, right? But then, of course, other people are saying, no, but if you, if you, if you get loose on that, um, pretty soon there's going to be a slippery slope. You're going to be covering over all sorts of sins that people ought to be held accountable for, you know, especially if it's a close friend or a family member. Um, you, know, you, you might enable even more crime. And so the second school of thought is, nope, you know what? Just by faith in God, we've got to be true to God and to the facts. Lying is not just saying something that doesn't accord with love. It just doesn't accord with reality. If you're going to speak the truth, you have to speak the facts. A lie is anything that's contrary to the facts. And so if somebody asks you, if you like my haircut, you know, or, or does this swimsuit make me look fat? You should give a really honest answer. You know, like what one person said, you know, the question, does this swimsuit make me look fat? You know, the truth of the matter is no, it's not my swimsuit that makes me look fat. It's my fat that makes me look fat. But, you know, are we obligated to say these things? If the Nazis come knocking at your door looking for Jewish people, it's like, dang it, yes, I'm hiding the Jews, I'll show you. Well, there is something seems wrong in that as well. You know, it's like people are more important than, you know, little white lies or life-saving lies. What do you do? Well, maybe the best ethicists, Christian ethicists, say that these two principles... You want to speak what's true to a person, what's noble and faithful to them, but also what's faithful to the facts. You might be able to integrate them best if we say, hey, the real measure of whether or not you're telling the truth or lying is, are you conforming to Christ? We're called to be the people who conform in every way to Christ. And so that's my last brief concluding point. We trust in the one true witness. We trust in Christ. You know, we know what John 1 says about Jesus, the word becoming flesh. John 1, 14, we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. One who knew how to speak the truth in love. Love for a person faithfulness to the facts, they're both in Jesus, full of grace and truth. The book of Revelation calls him faithful and true. These are the words of the amen. You know, the one who says, let it be the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. This is Jesus. And he bore such faithful witness from God to us, showing us what God is really like. Jesus, the Bible says, is the exact representation of God in human flesh. You want to know what God's like? You look to Jesus. He is faithful and true. But not just true to God's character, true to God's plan. Jesus was so faithful and true to us that he bore all the lies that people spoke against him, that got him crucified in order to be faithful and true to God's redemptive plan for our lives, to pay the penalty for our sins. 
that we might be united with him by faith and that he might pour his very Holy Spirit into us. Jesus, who is faithful and true, is the only one who can make us faithful and true. And when people do it, it's a beautiful thing. Now, I'll tell you a happier story from the Olympic Games. You know, Sidney McLaughlin Leveroni, Leveroni, who is the world record gold medal 400 meter hurdler uh, from the United States and a committed sister in Christ. You know, she made a promise to God that whatever she was going to do, it was going to be for him and for his glory. And she has been so faithful and so outspoken, but in gracious ways, about who Jesus is to her. And, you know, I've, I've seen a number of things now uh, from Sydney McLaughlin uh, uh, Lavroni about uh, her faith. I mean, you know, she wears this little uh, necklace around her, her neck. It just says, all for God. She had it on in the Paris Olympics. Uh, she's a person who immediately after the race put her hands up to heaven and just said, thank you, God. Whenever she's interviewed, she makes sure that God gets the glory. She says, I mean, I, I just determined a long time ago, God's going to get the glory for anything, everything I do. Uh, she was on some YouTube piece, you know, uh, 10 things that I can't live without. I think GQ puts this out and she's going through her favorite things, cosmetics and candy and stuff like that. But then she has her Bible, her study Bible. This thing's indispensable to me. She just puts it right out there um, in, in ways that most people wouldn't. She was on the Kelly Clarkson show being interviewed and she had written a book and telling a story not only about her faith in God, but who God is to her in her own anxiety and some mental health issues that she has had. She's an amazing witness to the truth of Jesus. Friends, that's a big part of this commandment as well. We're not bearing false witness against our neighbors, but we do want to be the kind of people who are bearing true witness to them, especially as Christ's witnesses. You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be empowered to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. God help us to be those kinds of people to the eternal flourishing of our neighbors. God be with you. Thanks for checking out our online teaching. If you enjoyed this content and would like some more information about us, head over to our website at www.willowdalechapel.org or download our app. There you can stay up to date on any events, ministries, and other opportunities we have coming up at Willowdale Chapel.